All right, then we will call this meeting to order for April 8th, 2021 for the Longmont Housing and Human Service Advisory Board. Um, our first um, item on the agenda is public invited to be heard. And I don't believe that we have anyone um, waiting to be heard. No, we just had the one gentleman who wanted to observe and hopefully okay. he'll pop in. All right. So our second um, item is approving the minutes from the March 11th meeting. Um, I'm gonna double check that we have both Karen and Brian here because um, we may not be able to vote on. I'm here, the organizer apparently has turned off my right to have the video, which oh. may speak to my appearance. <laughs> Okay. Sure. Sorry, Brian, that was me. <laughs> As you walked away, I turned off your video and your I forgot that I had to do it again. Still it's you, this. Mr. Co-host with the power. <laughs> it went to my head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we have a motion to approve or any questions about it? Diana. I was just going to say, I actually wasn't at the last board meeting, so I was going to abstain from voting to approve, but does that cause an issue with Quorum? Nope. No. I, I move to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Okay. Do I, we have a second? Okay. Karen Phillips has seconded. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, please raise your hand. Okay. So we've got five. All opposed? Zero. Any abstentions? Diana is abstaining. All right, the minutes are so approved. Yes, Diana, you're muted. Sorry, I should have raised okay. it initially, but the minutes did reflect that um, no members were absent at the last meeting and I was absent, so they should be amended to reflect that I wasn't there, I think. Thank you for that. Um, Karen, we're good there. Do we need, we don't need to do anything else, I assume. Yeah, we, we, we didn't include her, but we didn't indicate that she was absent. <laughs> so, you know, Feeling you just can't get important. good help these days. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we'll, make that, we'll make that correction. Thanks, Karen. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is the site visit matrix review and the site visit report. I believe that starts with you, Eliberto. It does, and I need a second to get the site matrix up so I can share it. Sure. Um, give me one second. Juggling your many roles on this meeting, including a technical advisor. Um, All right, it'll be one, okay, almost there. I, I just want to share that I the million dollar idea in my life that I'm not going to do is making t-shirts that say you're on mute. I'm pretty sure somebody's done that already. I, yeah, I believe that's uh, that's happened. All right, all right. somebody else can have it. You're just about a year late, but that's all right. I, know. <laughs> I, I will I'm say that. I wish you were on mute. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my. Um, I will say that it's been a while since we've had anyone join with a very interesting name put by like a child or someone that they share a Zoom account with. Um, but, you know, um, a friend of mine joined a 500 person company wide Zoom the other day and had had the name that was put in place by her seven year old son. Um, so she was... <laughs> I'm not actually going to repeat what it was, but I'll leave it to your That's imagination. That's because we're, re we're recording, you know. <laughs> yes, I'm going to leave it to you all to imagine what that was while Ellie Berto finished just getting his presentation ready. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to okay. uh, get get the, the the matrix up. Okay. Here we can go. We, can, you all, can you all see my screen? Yes. And, and it's, it's, it's really what I'm asking the board is any input. I mean, we... we talked about this is what we think we want and i put it together the question is is this really what we want are there other things you want me to add at this point it's pretty basic um but i wanted to start with something 
Uh, and I did tr start with the two agencies that we have done site visits and, and Deanna's gonna share about her site visit th that we did. Um, but just wanted to start there. This is the site visit matrix. And basically what the board had asked for is they want to know what was the funded amount? What did they get last year? Outcome measures that they that they uh, contracted for this year, and if we had them, what prior years? Now, interestingly, the first two agencies that we have did site visits are new agencies or newer agencies that, that have not, so we don't have any prior years outcomes to for them. Um, but I'm just wondering, is there anything else that you all want um, to see on this, or or that would be helpful for your site visits? Um, Brian? And is I have a quick question before Brian. Um, is the intention here for this to be what the board members use when we do the site visit, um, or to fill it, or to present when they're presenting to the group? Or no, I, I understand well, the, the use case for this matrix. I, I the way that I took I, the way that I took it, Kaylin, when we first talked about it, is that the board wanted some more specific information besides the application, right? They wanted to know what were, what did, what were they funded in the past? How had they done with their contract? What, you know, had, what outcomes had they, had they reached or achieved? It wasn't necessarily about presentation. It was more um, background information was my understanding. But again, that's what I understood that could be wrong. So background information where essentially you would help fill in this information before the board member does the site visit. I, and that's what I've done. I've, I've sent it before the board member has done the site visit. And so the board member goes into the site visit with this information. Got it. Okay. Brian, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, thank you. One thing that I think would be helpful are any staff notes that could be useful for us to follow up on during a site visit or ask about. I know that in the past we've had agencies that maybe had like longstanding board issues or uh, diversity kinds of questions. And I think the site visit can be a good time just to learn a little bit more about what kind of steps they're taking. So I will say that that type of information, typically if there is an issue is in, and I do send this as well to the board members, is my desk audit, because it does ask about, so if I have, if I have concern, um, then I, many times I'll put it in, in the, in the desk audit. Uh, typically it's been more on the documentation side, for example, a lack of a grievance process or uh, just, you know, um, no, or, or a lack of a, of a board nomination process. Um, or other things are missing, or, and sometimes I'll even put things that I think are really good. Like for example, somebody had a really great strategic plan. They'll say, I'll put in the notes, this is a really good strategic plan. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kimberly. I was just wondering if um, the number of individuals served would be in the prior year's outcomes, or is there another document that would share that? Like the number of people well, impacted? I, I could add, a, I could add I could add that to this document too. I'm not sure if there's a more appropriate place, but it would be nice to know their, their impact. No, I think that's a good place for it. Yeah, that's a good place for it. I can add it. Um, along those lines, I think it might be interesting, the funding amounts um, and the prior year funding amounts. Um, two things I, I thought of is, um, if it's possible to pull it easily, is um, their annual budget overall. So we can understand like how does the city's funding play into their overall budget. We have some where the city funds a good percentage of what they're doing. Um, and some where the city is like a little tiny amount of their total of their total programming budget. Um, for me, it helps seeing that context of where they're getting their funding mix from. And then the second thing I was thinking of is um, we have some agencies who there's not gonna be prior year funding amounts or prior year outcomes, but they right. have applied in the past and then they, they were rejected and then, then they were accepted. Um, do we, I don't know if there's any thing that would be useful from the fact that like they previously hadn't been funded or they had and then they, 
weren't again. Um, I don't know if that's helpful information for other board members that might be getting a little too like granular to, to be helpful for a site visit. So, so the budget one question is, is easier to answer because that's, you, you could always just pull up the application or I could, I, could, I could download the application from the EC Impact site. So we could do that because their budgets are there, right? And so are their financials from the application. Um, the, yeah, the, I, I would question how deep you want to go into this. I mean, yeah, years ago I, we changed we changed the site visit to be less. You know, it was very structured, and then we kind of went the other way, and then it feels like the pendulum swing back, which is fine. I'm just that that's fine. That the the board has discretion to to do that. I'm just pointing out that the pendulum seems to swing back to a more structured. Um, in this, case, I'm thinking, in this case, I'm thinking like having structure for the information a board member has going into it. And then we also talked about um, having a structure for the for board members presenting out to the rest of the board so that uh, or some like, you know, way of sharing that information other than just um, an oral report where it can be hard to tra track like what information there was. Um, I don't think. I mean, my personal opinion is that I don't think we should like say, oh, board members should be asking about X, Y, Z. Like I would like to use everyone's sort of knowledge and experiences and perspectives, different perspectives, because I think that we all bring different perspectives to these site visits. And I'd like to lean into that, um, but having enough information that board members would find helpful, um, I think is, that, that strikes me as what we're trying to do here is have sufficient information so board members um, can be prepared going into those and not just um, the, the flailing, um, which is what, you know, I do if I don't, if I don't have enough information sometimes, so. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I think I, I, most of the stuff you're asking for is pretty, I mean, like I said, the applications are there. The ones about being rejected and then, I mean, I, I, I know I can go back but because I can get you all previous funding round applications. You know, I, I, as I said that and talked about it, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think that's as useful. So, and it's a lot of work for low gain. So let's set that aside. Okay. Okay. Um, Deanna. So the only thing I was going to add is that, you know, for like a new agency, this, matrix, you know, there, we can't really plug any of this information in for really a new agency, right? So I, I don't know if we, and maybe it's just not possible, but I don't know if we need to think of some additional ways to sort of measure some of this stuff for a new agency. I mean, I felt like I I sort of, I mean, you were talking about floundering a little bit in terms of coming up with the, the site visit matrix for the site visit. It was hard to, to conceptualize this for me because it's a new agency and there's not really a lot to, to plug into it. So I don't really have a suggestion for that, I guess. So that's maybe this is not entirely helpful, but I, I'm just saying that I don't know that this matrix is really very useful necessarily for a new agency. Well, it would still have the current funded amount and the outcome measures that yes. from their current application, right? Of what they say they're doing. Right. So the site visit is an opportunity to check in on whether they're at, like how those things are going and what's happening, I guess. Um, Deanna, to your point, do you think that... Um, pulling any, I mean, if, if we have just a copy of their application where they explain like going into that site visit, um, I feel like now that I've seen applications, I have a better sense of what agencies are doing. But when I did my first site visit, I was like, sure, let's talk about it. But I didn't fully connect what they were doing with um, what I was asking. And so maybe even just having a copy of the application plus this matrix is enough to, to help me formulate questions. Yeah, and Eliberto sent me the desk, got it for it too. So I, I had some some background for it. I mean, it may just simply be that for new agencies that there's not necessarily a, a great matrix that we can even develop. I'm just saying it was a little conceptually, especially I guess because it's the first one, it was conceptually challenging for me to figure out how to plug the stuff into this. Got it. Um, Councilwoman Christensen. Pulling around here while you were talking not ignoring you, but um, we have on the 
associated with our website, we have a really interesting um, budget prioritization um, page that shows you, for those of you who think visually, shows you exactly how our budget is broken down in little colored slots. And it's interesting because of course, everybody else has big giant color blocks and um, housing and human services has little tiny little bits of very many different, different colors blocks. But um, I just sent that link to Karen and Eliberto and they can pass it on. But if you type in the year you want and you wanna look at how our budget is broken down, it's, a, it's really interesting and it's a, an interesting tool to uh, play with. You can see how everything is allotted, but you can find it to yourself by going to the finance department and budget prioritization on the uh, city website. Great, thank you. Uh, Karen Roney. So one, one uh, logistical thing. So Alberto, do you want to stop sharing your screen? So, so Michael has now joined the meeting. So would you let him in and then um, I, he did. Yeah, I did let him in and he is muted and his video is okay. on. Got it, thanks, thanks. Um, so then my second thing is, is and this and this gets back to what um, you know what Deanna was just kind of you know thinking about as far as what else to include for agencies that are newly funded. And I don't know, Caitlin, if this would be helpful, but maybe maybe for new agencies that this might be where any kind of comments that the advisory board made in the in their evaluation process um, you know of that agency maybe that's where that information could go because um, if there were some you know concerns or if there were comments that advisory board members made um, you, you know that that could be information that would be helpful I don't know just just throwing that out there yeah, we don't really use the comments in other in when we were doing the like the evaluation of them. So um, right. I could actually see that being useful for all of the agencies. So if we when we do the if we get a copy of the application, Diana, when you got the copy, was it just their application or did we also have the evaluation of it? Well, there, there's ten of you evaluating, so I would have to go individually and get the comments and put them into a document. Okay. Um, you know, so, but maybe for new, um, I mean, even just getting overall scores, um, I, so we have a sense of where they fell in, in things could be helpful. I don't, they've all been funded. So they were all high, the highest scorings um, in, of what we got. So, so, uh, so I guess my question is, really go ahead, Eliberto. I guess my question, Caitlin, is what, what is it that we want from this matrix? What, what, what's, what's this? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm gonna steal that thing from Karen. What's what's our what's our un tragic unmet need that we need to <laughs> to meet? Because because yeah, I mean I, I'm fine doing whatever. I just want to make sure that I'm, that we're we are providing you as board members that which you feel you need to do this job best way possible. <clears throat> um, Diana, you mentioned not being sure what to plug into these, but this looks like to me this looks like stuff that like Eliberto is gonna to provide to us. So you wouldn't be plugging information into these necessarily. Um, but my question to you is, are, is what you're looking for something to help like guide the questions you're asking or information to bring, what information you need to bring back to the board or something else? So when um, I had talked to Eliberto about this uh, agenda last week, he had, and I had talked about sending something out to the board that I had prepared, and I frankly just didn't get it together because I wasn't exactly sure what to put together. And that may simply, as I say, just be a function of the fact that it's really the first sort of time, um, because I looked at the matrix and I was like, man, I have no idea what to plug into the some of these categories, right? So, um, but maybe once we do a couple of these, it'll be more obvious, but I, I sort of I wasn't sure what to include in the package. So I kind of got bogged down and didn't do it. So um, does that answer your question, Caitlin? Yeah, so it sounds to me like, so it, um, it would be helpful probably to have this, whatever this matrix is filled out when, when a, after a board, so 
blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm gonna, there's two uses for this particular matrix. One is helping the board member who is going to the site visit to have some background information for asking questions. The second would be to include it with the board packet when that board member is presenting on the organization so that the rest of the board members have some context for any comments. Additionally, it sounds like, and for, forgive me if I'm wrong here, is it would be helpful to have a couple of questions or some kind of template that board members fill out after a site visit with information that they would want to share with the rest of the board that would also get sent out in the packet when they're presenting so that there's sort of some written information as well as you know a board member presenting on that site visit um does that seem like i'm so i'm hearing like two different needs that were one is for board members going to the site visit and one is for board members receiving information about someone else is someone else having conducted a site visit. So there are two different things to solve for. Um, Graham. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I appreciate the casual nature of the site visits. And I think that any background information such as this matrix is really just going to help um, in cases where you know, let's say an agency is applied year after year and they fail to get funding or they get less than great funding because there's some issue that, that they, they're constantly failing on. And I, it just, it would be a missed opportunity to have one of us meet with them and not address that issue if it's long standing. So maybe a matrix isn't appropriate for every agency, but you know, if agency X just constantly is not working on board diversity, then Maybe that's something worth bringing up when you're doing a site visit and talking about that. Um, but I, I don't know, I guess maybe I'd be interested to hear from staff what kind of um, conversation is had post, uh, post awarding or non awarding Do these agencies reach back out and really want to understand why they didn't get the full award and what it is they really need to work on and hone that or is it just like, oh, like a report card where you just sort of throw it in the trash and on with your life. Um, hmm. At least that's what I do with the report cards. I don't know. Um, Councilwoman Christensen, did you have a comment on this section? You still have like the electronic hand raised, but I'm not sure if it's still up from the previous time. Uh, no, I don't have a comment. I don't think. Okay. Um, Thanks for on, asking. On Zoom, can you, I think there's something to like unraise your hand maybe? Um, I'm not, a, okay, Eliberto. Yeah, no, um, I think this is really helpful. This, this last piece was really helpful because it, 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 it gives direction on, it's not just about the background information. I can provide applications, I could whatever, but it's really about the, the, the need also is, or that needs to be met is giving the board the tool, a tool to help present. Um, and so I could, I could come up with some, some, I don't know what to call them, either questions or, or aspects of this that you find most valuable that we could plug into this matrix. So it'd be like a two section matrix, right? I mean, the first part is my information to you. The second part is what the board what the board member wants to share with the with the board yeah and it could be as simple i mean for that part it could be as simple as saying like you know um you know were there were there any highlights of the visit were there any concerns in the visit were there any particularly compelling stories or pieces of information that came out during the conversation like we could leave it very the idea would be to be very broad um and just support folks in bringing that information to the board. I think one of the concerns folks had was, I did a site visit and then I present on it four months later and I don't necessarily remember. And if we have just a little bit of process, like it doesn't have to be a ton. To Graham's point, the casual nature of these is really um, allows us to establish some of those relationships with it. And then um, just giving folks a little bit to share that with the rest of the board. Um, some people do very well with just an oral presentation. Some people really like to see a couple of notes written down. Um, and so I think having both is, is helpful. So. 
Um, do you feel like we're in a good spot on this, Ellie Bertrand? Does anyone else have any other comments about this matrix or what we need for site visits going forward? Okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Hi, Madeline, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Yep, you're welcome. So, um, the next item is the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board role in the city budget process and increasing funding for human services set aside. I am not sure who is speaking to this. Uh, that, that would be me. Okay, great. You are up then, Karen, to- I to see, give, I see to that. give an intro here. Uh, so, so this, um, this item came off of the list of, of things for um, the, the work plan list that we generated back in uh, January, I believe. So, so this is really twofold. I think one, just to talk about the, the upcoming budget process and, um, and then two, to find out what else uh, the the board had in mind regarding this this topic. So I believe when we were having this conversation back in January, there was also some um, you know some comments or some questions about you know can the advisory board have roles in you, you know like when the city is considering grant funding or or to basically to have input in other. Um, budget kinds of, of issues or other financing for human services beyond what you have direct uh, control over, if you will. So that's kind of the, the second part of this. So uh, in, in the next couple of months, uh, staff will be working on the 2022 budget. And, um, and and so uh, just a reminder for those of you who have been on the board and also for new um, advisory board members is uh, two years ago, we went before the city council and had a discussion about uh, basically um, different strategies or approaches for increasing the amount of general fund revenues that are set aside for human service agency grants that you all you know, manage the um, at that point in time when we had the conversation, the amount, uh, the percentage of uh, general fund revenues set aside for human service agency funding was two point zero five percent, and the advisory board had a recommendation that we wanted to uh, move that percentage up to 3%. Um, 3% was, um, there, there was some, it wasn't just necessarily something we pulled totally out of the air, but, um, but it, it, it was actually, it was, a, it was a goal that the, um, that in 2007, 2008, that we were pursuing, we were pursuing at that point in time, an increase to, uh, to 3%. And uh, we, we made it the first year with the, with the city council. And then, um, as you recall, what was happening back in 2008 or so was that we, um, you know, we had a pretty significant uh, recession. And so we were just trying to, um, we were just trying to keep our service levels uh, with decreasing revenues. And so we did not pursue uh, a, a further increase. We increased it for one year, but we did not make it up to the up to the three percent. So um, a, a couple of years ago, we decided to to try that again. The 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 trigger for that, if you will, I don't want to say trigger. The uh, the compelling reason to um, to to consider that again was that we had. Also, the previous year, we had um, allocated, we took a, a significant amount of dollars that used to go into the competitive grant process, and we, um, we allocated um, uh, about $700,000 or so for 
um, our homelessness and um, and homeless prevention services. So we took that off of the of, of the amount that we had available for human service agencies. So um, so it, it helped us to address a compelling need in the community. But we we did so, if you if you will, on the uh, on the backs of the agencies that had been um, counting on and relied on city grant funding to fund basically our um, our social determinants of health uh, services. So so our reason two years ago was to, to go back to city council was to say you know hey we would like to um, keep the you know basically keep the funding that we have available for addressing um, homelessness and and for homeless prevention services we'd like to to keep that amount but we would like to be able over time to build back up the amount that's available to the human service agencies through the competitive grant process so so that was a direction actually that we uh, we gave uh, council several scenarios and what council landed on was that we would work over a three year period to to increase the um, to, to increase the amount of set aside funding up to um, up to three percent. So we made a, a, a jump in 2020 that went up to, I think, 2.37%. Um, and then, of course, in the 2021 budget, we were dealing with COVID impacts. And it's like any anytime we try to increase human service agency funding, we have a, a financial disaster. So I think we should maybe not do that anymore. I don't know. But anyhow, um, but but the council was uh, committed to continuing to increase the funding because obviously um, you know they were able to see the um, the value of the services that we fund and and that our community was relying on a lot of the services that we fund particularly during that economic crisis and so um, we had asked to go up to uh, I think 2.7 percent but what council did do is they did increase the uh, percentage of set aside funding to uh, 2.52%. So we did have an increase. It wasn't as much as we asked for, but we got, um, but the human services um, did receive more, um, an increase in funding, um, more so than a lot of the other services that basically were at a, at a, a flat maintenance level. So, um, so, so this year in the, in the 2022 20, budget, um, we, you know, I think what what's what staff will do is is to go ahead and and crank that request up to the up to that three percent, um, so that we will continue to have so you know so that we will build back up um, funding that uh, that the agencies uh, would have had. That basically, I was looking for the amount. Um, it it basically would restore. Um, Restore funding to the to the level that we had in I think in 2019 before we for 2018. One more. 2017. Pre 2017 numbers because that's when you. Oh. Went to okay. Is that is that in dollar amount? You mean that it would restore? Yeah, just in dollar money? amount, right? To to get it back to that level, and then with. Uh, again, with the uh, with the the percentage of set aside as revenues increase or as they you know decrease, you, you know the the funding will um, you know will go up or be reduced based on that. So our goal was to get it back to the amount that that was available through the competitive process. Twenty seventeen, pre twenty well in twenty seventeen, and uh, and then be able to continue to build it from there. So, um, so. You know, so that's that really is the uh, the background, and and I guess if the advisory board has any other thoughts about that, do you think? Well, just want to throw that out there. So, what we would be requesting in the twenty twenty two budget was to to bump that up to um, up to that three percent set aside, um, unless the advisory board had other thoughts or ideas. 
that you would want to uh, provide around that? Uh, Brian. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so I'm fully in support of asking for that increase. I think the economic projections for 2022 are looking pretty good at this point. Um, and if they're not, the money's needed, which is the, uh, the conundrum that we live in is that when the economy's good, the funding is better and the need is lower. And when the economy's bad, the need is higher and the funding uh, isn't as good. So I certainly support asking for it. And I think at some point we should also entertain discussions of other potential funding mechanisms that are dedicated to health and human services, specifically health. Um, Councilwoman Christensen. Uh, I'm certainly in support of this and I, what do I know? But I, I really do think that maybe everybody but one person would, would maybe all of them would uh, support this. So I, I hope we can do this because really just to bring it up to what it was five years ago was kind of, kind of sad, but you know, we really have had a lot of um, <laughs> difficult times over the last uh, eight years. Um, so anyway, I, I hope we have a good chance of getting this passed. Kimberly. I'm definitely in support as well. And I'm curious um, just to know per capita how the funding compares between 2017 and the 3% that's being proposed for 2022. If we're maintaining the per capita over time when we compare those two years or if it's dropped, just, just curious because that might be something to consider in the future, hopefully as um, the economy strengthens. We certainly could look at that. Um... And so we could pull those numbers together if, if maybe that's a, we didn't talk about that as a per capita basis, but if that's a, if that's a measure we want to consider, um, we'd be glad to put that information together. That's a good point. Um, one other thought that I had that, um, that you mentioned that we don't see as much of, and this sort of goes into the other, I think we've talked about quote unquote other areas where the board might um, be involved or provide input. Um, is you've meant, you mentioned that some of the funding in the past got shifted from the competitive grant process into services provided by the city for homelessness, mm -hmm. for example. Um, Councilwoman Christensen mentioned earlier that there's um, some of the budget breakdown and kind of scoring around which budget areas, um, different things within the city budget fall under. Um, I would find it um, I would I would love to know to see sort of over time, um, even if this grant money has gone down, what the city funding has looked like for things like homelessness, um, anything around like Boulder community, like the health care, um, the Boulder County, you know, health and mental health and those things that, that I think that the city helps fund, but not necessarily through this competitive grant process because it's easy for us to sort of like silo in on this competitive grant process as how the city is funding what our community needs. But it's really clear that there's a lot of other things that the city is doing. And so um, helping us contextualize in terms of what the city, where the city is spending on similar types of services, but that are not going through the competitive grant process would be super helpful. Um, because I also think, I think about even having conversations with folks in the community you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, we had $800,000 that we gave to com community partners, but the city is also funding other programs um, and being able to have a perspective of like, um, you know, that accounts for 15% of cities. Fund I, I don't know what the percentage is, but, you know, getting a sense of what that is. Um, this also strikes me um, in light of our conversation um, last summer, we had many conversations around you know, funding of um, police versus community services and this idea that those are opposed. But um, in many, in, in some of those conversations, it was really comparing this competitive grant process to that funding and not necessarily the entirety of what city was spending on it. And I think that it would be good for us to see that as well. Um, so I'd love, I, I can pull <laughs> the spreadsheet, um, but if it's something that staff can help us get a picture of that would be great. Um, Councilwoman Christensen. Uh, 
I can help you with a, a little bit of that. I sent the, uh, the link to that um, uh, breakdown to uh, Karen and Eliberto so they can forward that. But um, I don't think the city on that page has quite the granular uh, breakdown you're looking for in terms of exact uh, agencies that they're giving money to because the budget itself is like, oh, no, it's really <laughs> huge. But it does, tell, it does tell you on a department level, for instance, you could look down and see how much the department of the police department is spending on uh, school resource officers, on homeless outreach, on um, restorative justice, uh, on uh, body cameras, I think. That might be, Things like body cameras might be uh, too granular. That yeah. would just be in the budget. But um, anyway, it, it gives you an idea. For instance, there is this huge thing that says electricity. That's like, that's Moby Dick. Housing and human services is the little minnows swimming around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I download, I download. Believe the- between that, that's the, uh, the krill, <laughs> you know, the, the specific areas because it is very, I really think this is a very helpful way of understanding exactly how the, the uh, it was prioritized. And at the top of the page um, of this, it explains how the city prioritizes things and how the city scores these things. So that is this something that is a mandated, a federally mandated program, then we have to fund it. Is it it's something that is mandated by the state? It is something that is critical to not having people die, um, things like that. And so there, there is a scoring system that helps with the prioritization, but there are also areas that we, the city did a huge um, survey from 2013 to 2014 uh, to find out what the city, the, the, the residents of the city actually wanted. And while I have my issues of, surveys and all that stuff. I do think that generally these are these are the things that morally and principally the city wants to see. And so that is our prioritization. And so it's a very helpful way, I think, of looking at a budget, which is not just numbers. It really goes to people, especially uh, from housing and human services to people that makes a huge difference. So, yep. Yeah, I downloaded the spreadsheet and saw, for example, you know, 250,000 going directly to conflict resolution facilitation, um, you know, which, which when you consider even just that amount as compared to the amount that we're doing in the competitive grants, that's a significant investment in that type of program for um, for us and for like children and youth services, you know, 450,000 toward these youth services that help provide resources for under-resourced communities in our city. Um, and so that's, those are fairly significant, you know, the city budget is huge, but we also are having significant investment in those areas that are not just where we are. Um, so Karen. So I guess the question is, um, you, you know, so we can certainly put together some information you know, as 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 um, Councilmember Christensen talked about, I mean, the there's a priority based budgeting, which is the 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 process that she's talking about, and some of that is very self explanatory. Some of it really isn't, and so, but so, I mean, I think I think Eliberto and I have a pretty good idea of of what you know, really, what you're interested in is is that there is a larger city investment in. Um, in you know human services beyond what we offer through the grant program. So there's a lot of direct services that we provide um, or maybe even contracts that aren't part of this process. And so I think we can we can gather that information and and I guess it's my it's it's a similar question to what Alberto asked before is so and and the the purpose of having that information would be what? So just just for understanding. So, cause we can gather that and um, just, just wondering how that will be useful. 
Yeah, so I'd welcome thoughts from other folks um, on this, but my my first thought is one, helping board members understand the context that we're working in. Okay. Um, because I think that helps us understand the job that we're doing. The second though is, so you mentioned that staff is gonna go, um, and I think that we're all supportive of staff requesting the increase to 3% of city general funding. Um, I think that there's the potential over time to see like, okay, maybe the city starts increasing this, but then does the does funding for some of these other things start decreasing, but we're not seeing that. Like, so it looks, pop or is funding across those going up? And so that looks like what we think it should be. I think that um, folks on this um, board have an interest in these housing and human services, um, not just through the competitive grant funding. And so, um, Folks have talked about going to city council and requesting, you know, we, we sent a letter to city council last summer um, suggesting more investment in, um, you know, alternatives to policing for the community. Um, I think we all have an interest in that. And so being able to understand that context could also help us advocate for, hey, we've only got, you know, grant re requests for $200,000 related to housing the amount for housing that the city council has allocated hasn't changed in five years. I don't think that's true, but like give us that context because then we could say, well, maybe it's not that we need to do more grant funding. Maybe it's that the city needs to support more directly instead of grant funding because we mm -hmm. don't have service providers that are meeting that need. Um, so that's my, that's my thought um, is that in particular, we have seen an imbalance in some of those areas in terms of grant funding and being able to say like, okay, well, that need isn't being met. Does the city need to do it? Or do we need to find another way to, to meet that need? Because we don't have enough community partners that are doing X, Y, or Z. So, um, Brian, I think you had your hand up first. Thank you. Yeah, I agree that I, I think it's good for us to understand our role in the ecosystem and that kind of information can help us understand how we can add the most value. Uh, I also think it helps us be a more responsible supplicant if we're going to go and ask for more money to understand what else is happening so that we're not just, I don't know, you know, like, hey, we want more. I don't care what else is going on. We want more. Uh, it's nice to know what else is going on and be supportive of that work. Councilwoman Christensen. You took your hand down, but you didn't unmute. <laughs> I can't be expected to do everything. Um, uh, yeah, well, you, you're certainly, everybody is welcome to um, call. I wish we could meet again, but I'm hoping in two months we'll be able to actually meet again because it's, it's just been horrible. Uh, but uh, you can always come as an individual and speak, but you can also write a letter as a group. Um, and even though it is maybe seems uh, not to be directly concerned with uh, what this board is doing, if it is in any, any way related, for instance, anything having to do with housing or any of the human services, you can certainly advocate for that. And I think that that's exactly what you guys should be doing. And um, uh, council would love to hear from you. So please do, you know. Thank you. Appreciate that perspective. Um, do any other comments about um, the board's involvement and then the request for additional um, grant funding this year or anything else related to the board's role in the budgeting process? Okay, um, then we are on to our next item on- Well, so let, oh, oh, there's sorry. Karen Go first. Go ahead, Karen. So I just, uh, I guess I would like to go back and ask Brian about his comment. Not the most recent one, but the one where you said, you know, you mentioned about pursuing other funding 
um, particularly for health services. So I'm, I'm interested if you would, you would expand a little bit on that thought. Yes. Well, I'm disappointed that you asked because there wasn't much behind that. Thought, but I'll, <laughs> so, I'll try to fill it out a little bit. Well, I just didn't know whether we missed it or, you know, so I just, I didn't no. know what pursuing other funding, yeah. what that really meant. Um, so in your Karen, mind. when I think of other communities that are able to spend more dollars just in general, um, sometimes that's because they may have a special tax in place, for instance, that helps provide funding, or um, they, they're getting money from the Colorado Health Foundation to run a program. Um, so it, it's really, it, this is about as shallow a pond as we're going to step <laughs> in by asking me, but there's just like this this kind of nagging sense of maybe there's other money out there other than asking for a percentage from the general fund. Right. Right. So that, that, that's helpful to understand Brian. And I would say, um, you know, certainly as, um, you know, as, as, as staff and, and El Alberto, maybe we can, we can figure out how to capture that is we, we do go after, um, a variety of, of grant resources. So we we have private foundations, we have um, state money that we you know we pursue or federal grants. So um, so we do a pretty good job of of pursuing other resources that will you know will help us. And most of the time that is about um, helping us maybe establish some new programs. And then what we need to do is to figure out out, all right, how are we going to have a sustainable funding source for something that we try and we find out that that's pretty effective. So, um, but, you know, and what we, what we really haven't pursued would be, you know, some very specific targeted, you know, tax. And so yeah. that happens quite a bit in like city of Boulder has um, obviously there's their, their sugary beverage tax <laughs> was, um, Big time uh, generates quite a bit of money um, that that goes directly to to fund a, a variety of services, but but we haven't necessarily pursued that um, very often as a I don't think as a as a community. Obviously, we've had we've had open space uh, targeted taxes as well as for um, supplemental public safety services, but yeah, but we do pursue grant opportunities for sure. And, and thank you for that. It, it's, I think this ties back to Caitlin's request for some of that right. other information so that, yeah, we have yep. more of that context. You bet. Thank you. Councilwoman Christensen. Yes, she got it. Um, so, um, yeah, our... Uh oh, you got muted somehow. I don't know if it was you or somebody accidentally muted you. Alberto wielding his power. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you don't want to cut off our councilwoman. <laughs> That's okay. I get cut off all the time here. Um. <laughs> so yeah, our staff is incredibly good about trying to do that, but it helps. It really, you know, when I first started doing this, I had no idea uh, <laughs> where all this money came from or how it worked at all. And so we get, for instance, um, Long Run Housing Authority, which is now the city council, which um, <laughs> gets money from HUD or used to before, well, five years ago. Um, <laughs> Now it might get money again from HUD. We get money from the state in, in terms of CHAFA, Colorado Housing and... Finance. Yeah, good. Finance. <laughs> we get money from DOLA, Department of Local Affairs. We get money from DORA, Department of Regional Affairs. We get money from all kinds of different private grants, but also public grants and um, uh, nonprofit grants and Believe me, staff just is running around. I mean, 
looking for every bit of money, but it does help to know that there really are a lot of resources out there, but it takes a huge amount of time to write those grants. And you have to really have people uh, who, who are familiar with doing that, to, to do that. Because if I tried to write a grant, I'm sure I wouldn't get a penny, but there are a lot of people uh, in our city government who are very good at that. Um, so, yeah, we do try to, it, it just helps to know what other people are doing and how this city functions. Mm -hmm. It's it's very complex. We have hundreds of people and they all have, and they're all doing something useful. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, grant writing is a huge part of running the city for every department, so. Um, Karen, any other questions you have for the board? Do you need anything for us to say like, yes, we support asking for additional funding this year or anything like that? I, th I think we have some good direction about moving forward um, with the original plan and coming back and providing some, um, some supplemental information that, you know, you might come back and say, and, you know, we will do our best to have that ready for the May meeting. And, um, you know, because it, it wouldn't be too late in May to, to change our, our path in terms of what we're requesting. So, so I think we've got what we need. And I think Brian's virtual hand is back up. I see that. Yes, Brian. Just real quickly, Karen, I don't want to add too much to your workload. Um, I have been made aware that the state of Colorado is not as prolific as some other states in pulling down federal funds in, in various areas. I don't know that that at all relates to this area that we're talking about, but it may be helpful to know whether it's the city of Longmont per capita or it's the state of Colorado as a state, how we do in securing funds that are available uh, from a federal level. You know, what's our performance look like and, and what would it take? And, and let's just start there. I, and I don't know if you have that, but if you do, amazing. <laughs> if not, don't add a whole lot to your workload to, to get yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, 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 I'm, I see that question. I'm like, oh, if you have it, that's really easy to pull. And if you don't, that could be like, that could be quite the rabbit hole for someone to go down to try to quantify. Well, we uh, won't go down a rabbit hole, but if that's something we can grab, we'll, we'll do that, Brian. But okay. All right. Yes, Councilwoman Christensen. It's the Polly. It's the Polly and Brian show tonight. <laughs> um, so a lot of that depends too on our state representatives and state senators. So as you know, we do not always get some shining stars to represent us. <laughs> and um, I have personally one of the other ways we get money is to send um, send people like me to Washington D.C. to go around and beg from our senators and representatives, give us the money. So if you've ever tried to get money from Ken Buck, um, it's not easy. Um, so it, it really depends upon, I mean, it, that's when it becomes very, uh, very political is they have to ask for that money and they have to advocate for that money. And we have some excellent representatives and senators and we have some less than stellar representatives. So, um, you know, that, that is a big part of it. Thanks. All right. Um, then our next item on the agenda, um, since I don't see any other hands at the moment, would be the quarterly update on Homesteady. I believe that's you, Eliberto. Yes, and I have that ready to go. Let me just get to the slideshow. Okay. All right, can we see this? Can everybody see a slideshow? Looks good. Okay. So yeah, I think we wanted to, and, and, and you know, the R Center, my first report that I sent to you was pretty slim on data. And so I went back and said, hey, you know, what, what can you get me? 
<laughs> so I can so I can give a little more robust report to the board. And so they 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 went back and got for sure twenty twenty more better you know uh, more robust twenty twenty data. Uh, the issue with twenty twenty one is you know the first quarter just ended on March thirty first, and there's still some of those clients because um, the program can last more than three months. Some folks are still in the midst of the program, receiving funds and working on their on their their um, housing strategies or ho re remaining house strategies. So, um, so the, the bulk of this will probably be much more year end or, or uh, 2020 data. Um, and you see some of it in October, I did this, the, you know, first year uh, data or first part of 2020. And so they just, they just sent me the rest of the data for 20, for 2020. Um, all right. So really as part of, so why I say 2017, 2017, 2016 were big years for the human services funding. Um, it's really when we changed and Homesteady was a part of it. Uh, yes, uh, we, we, we broke about 50% of the, the set aside to go to homelessness and homelessness prevention. Um, and, and that was because it was a, uh, it was very much prioritized in, in the 2017 human services needs assessment. As you know, it continues to be, even our 2020 assessment uh, has housing and, and, and sta stable housing as one of its, uh, if, it, as its greatest priority. So that has not changed uh, between 2017 and 2020. Um, so that's why things change in 2017. So basically here, just, just so you know, so the, the R Center gets 120,000, uh, it's, it's a total $200,000 um, contract, 120 is meant for um, um, direct client assistance, and so in 2020 they spent 117 thousand of that, um, and then they uh, the majority of it usually goes to rent. Um, that's just the way it is, um, and then utilities. Then deposit usually if it, if it's not sustainable to keep someone housed where they are housed, then they can use this funding. It's pretty flexible funding. They could use this to help someone find a new location. And we do have landlord incentives. So, um, in other words, if this if we can help the landlord keep the person housed, then we have funding for that as well. Um, and so that's how they use that. I believe that was used for water water break. Uh, to help them ensure that they could stay in housing. So um, here's at the end of the program. So this is exits when they have actually finished the program. So this actually doesn't cover the whole 46. I'm just go back because not everybody, the whole 46 weren't done in 2020. There are some clients that came in in December and they really, they're, you know, they're still, some of them may still even be in the program now. But these numbers represent only those that, finished the officially finished the program uh, and basically 97 percent were remained housed and three percent lost housing uh, and typically what what that happens is because folks you what has when it when it has happened is because folks are in non-compliance in other words they haven't followed through with the program and its requirements of to you know to um take the financial literacy classes or to, you know, work on a housing plan, that kind of meeting with their case plan, with the house, uh, home study case manager. So, but on, on, only 3% lost their housing. Um, this, I showed it to you last year. This is really important to me. It's, it's, it's an interesting data point. It says how many clients at program exits still return to the R Center for Services? And you can see that 39% were still accessing food, 18%, so this is a really important one, 18%, when it says return for financial support, um, that's actually for housing. So they came back later and said, we still need housing support. And then the 43%, those folks have not come back to the arts. In other words, they, they while we don't know what happened, because we, you know, it's hard to track them, we can assume that they either a are still housed and are doing better financially or have left the area um, something that but they are not access they have not continued to access services 
Um, and this is what we know of those that exited. Um, 57 remain at the same address, 29% moved out of the area and 14% moved in with another family. Um, so, you know, it, it shows that folks, uh, m the majority stay housed at the same address or they help or they, or they find more affordable housing elsewhere. And, and we've heard that before. I've heard it from um, uh, the St. Verain uh, liaison for homeless and family, Luis Chavez. We talked about this before in the past, how, you know, people are, are just leaving because they can't afford to, to live here. So it's, this is, this is, this to me is, is just verification of, of, of the information that I've heard before. So, and then there's just some household types. Um, you can see, and this has been the, the biggest percentage is single parents. Um, and there's a lot of data that talks about single parents being typically uh, more likely to be living in poverty. Um, that is just, that is the reality. Um, so here's 2021 data. So far there have been 15 people. And again, some of these 15 may have been, oh, I didn't change it, sorry, I just noticed I didn't change it. Some of these 15 may have come over from 2020. Um, a big thing, and actually, you know, I didn't talk about that in 2019, a lot more people reached this, the, the saving goal of one month rent. As you can imagine, 2020 has been very difficult for people to save one month's rent. Uh, it has been a challenge. And I can go back and get the data and, and, and bring it back to the board, but that has been, and so far nobody's done it this year. Um, they spent 20,000 so far, primarily again, rent being the, um, the big number. I will say that I, the utilities piece, there has been a lot of money for utilities. So people are, are accessing those funds outside of this program. Uh, and so utilities are less of an issue this year because and I, uh, there's just been a lot of funding both from Colorado nationally, from the CVRF, from the CARES Act dollars, we spent a lot of money on, um, on utilities. So, so there's been a lot of funding for utilities. That's why I think it's so low. And here's what we know about household types. Um, again, so far, single parent, uh, the, they've been the ones that have been accessing the program the most. And so that is it. I will stop sharing and, and answer any questions that anyone may have. Eliberto, the, um, those demographics of single, um, single parent, um, single adult, um, do they collect additional demographics around, um, for example, I know one of the things that came up during our funding round what, and the latest needs assessment was particularly support for seniors um, that we know. Um, do we have a sense of among single ad the single adults, is that skewed towards seniors, for example? Um, or, for, you know, do we, do we know anything else? Um, on this. We, we, we do, and, I, and I, could, I could find out more. I will say one of the changes that happened in, yeah, I can find out more. I'll leave it at that. I, there, there's been, a, 2020 has been a very unique year. Uh, but yes, I, I, can, I can definitely ask for more demographics. I, um, since they all go into BCC, I'm sure that they have a lot of, and BCC stands for Boulder County, um, Boulder County sure. Connect. Yeah. Which is a, a, a database. Okay, um, Madeline. Yes, um, I uh, have a question in terms of um, well, a lot of things have a lot of issues have come up uh, within other ethnicities uh, since. Um, the tragedies that we have recently uh, experienced, witnessed, um, experienced. Uh, specifically, um, the one that concerns me the most uh, right now is I have a, a, a family, um, friends that are Asian. After the situation 
the tragedy in Atlanta. Um, well, everybody knows what's been going on and, 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 and um, what has happened and is happening that um, uh, we didn't hear about it. It wasn't at the forefront. It wasn't at the top of the list uh, prior to the, that situation happening. And what I know that they have, I have tried to help specifically with housing. There's a family of approximately eight people. And um, there is basically one person that's providing for them all. And we just happened to be talking and she asked me, she said, well, do you know of anywhere I can go to get help? And I, of course, what kind of help? And she said, well, housing, my brother is handicapped and he has uh, three children and a wife and we have no resources. We, we've struggled and have been given the runaround with just trying to get a COVID shot, get COVID shots for us. So of course I reached out and I'm just wondering, um, uh, I made connection with them because I actually uh, went there to just offer condolences, you know, for from what happened. And so I want to want to know if any of you have had your friends, family or others that have had attention brought to them since those kinds of situations happened. Of course, we all know with the. Um, George Floyd and, and, and the Black Lives Matter situation. Um, we all know about those, but have, do you guys, uh, what has, what's been your experience De, uh, in terms of, of demographics? I'm curious to know. Um, Councilwoman Christensen. Put the little hand up. Um, You're fine. Madeline, are you asking about uh, anti-Asian discrimination in Longmont? Or are you asking about trying to get the this disabled man uh, housed? Both. I'm curious as to what others, what you know about or, or others on this board in terms of your own relationships. What have you heard of or what do you know of that has been uh, on the rise since that situation. And, and, and are your friends under attack like mine are? Um, I felt, oh, I was so upset to know that um, the mother is 62 and she was given the, I mean, they've been given, absolutely given nothing but the runaround. And so I called, I did make some calls for um, some very, very helpful people in Boulder um, and in the city of Longmont, I talked with Adriana. Adriana made a big difference. And so today, just today, this started about two and a half, three. Uh, well, as soon as that other situation happened, then this happened uh, with them. And so um, I, uh, yeah, I started, I started in, in Longmont with LMAC. And today they all got the first shot. Good, good. Yeah. Exactly. And I was like, <laughs> yay. Um, but the, the situation still remains that need housing. And I know Veronica over at the senior center. I don't know. I don't know any of the details, though. Um, I'm going to help them through it. So um, let me hush and, and let you address <laughs> well, what, you, I, what you're asking. OK, well, I have a friend who's uh, Japanese American. We've known each other for about 30 years and uh you know she's a very quiet person and she doesn't complain but she's made she has made a very she has mentioned many times lately that she is very uncomfortable being out on the street people look glare at her yes. people and of course there's the the example of the 60 eight year old woman in san francisco who was attacked Oh, by yeah. this jackass. Well, yes. of course, she doesn't really seem to understand. I mean, he didn't, he'd never run into uh, Chinese grandmothers from Chinatown like I have. You don't mess with them. Like, she had a 
big stick in there and she <laughs> sent him out on a gurney, which is good. I don't advocate violence, but that's exactly what he deserved. But it, it, it's really disheartening to me that it Julie, is. my friend Julia has lived here for as long as I have, about 32 years. And mm. now in her own neighborhood, she finds, she does not feel safe. And so, and she's told me that her friends also feel that way, who are uh, Japanese American or Asian American. It's, you know, it's uh, the legacy of our previous president who made hatred okay, made it fashionable. Right. right. Yeah. And so we really, I, I'm glad you brought that up and please do bring it up with LMAC because it's not, it's not somewhere else. It's here too. It is. It is. And it's unacceptable. I mean, we just have to not tolerate it. I mean, it's right. very disheartening. Right. It's very upsetting for me. And and I said, well, yeah, OK, join the crew group. It's not new to me or us. But at the same time, that does not make it anywhere close to being OK for anybody. It's just wrong, you know? And so I saw them yesterday and, and uh, they were in tears. They were so grateful. They were so grateful. And so I told them, we're going to stick with you. I, I told them about you guys and tell them about people, you know, the boards and, and people that I know are, are seriously wanting to help. Just that. We just want to help you. And so don't be embarrassed to ask for help. But Madeline, have you tried talking to the Disability Center? I have not. I have not yet. No, I have not. But I will. I'm, I'm writing it down right now. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I will. Uh, yeah, I'll ask questions. You know, that's the only way you'll get information because they're not going to voluntarily tell you. So I will. Uh, yes, but I, I appreciate you guys uh, listening. It's just very frustrating. Uh, yeah, it's very frustrating and unfair absolutely um if there's other ways folks can help do let us know madeline um please please do uh diana i just wanted to respond to madeline's point and say that i think there are a lot of communities really afraid right now and i think um my friends in the transgender community are terrified right now there's a glut of anti-trans um legislation happening um there's a lot of anger in this country right now, and it is very disheartening. I agree with you completely, Madeline. It is upsetting, and it's very difficult. And I really, really feel for those people who are not feeling safe in their own homes or walking down the right. street. It's right. awful. And um, yeah, it's awful. And I don't know how we can help that, but um, I just wanted to say that I recognize your point that you're raising and see it in lots of other communities, I believe too. I, I appreciate that. I do. It is very, it, it's very hurtful. You know, uh, I know you probably hear it in my voice, but I get so upset because they, they're just hardworking people. You know, they're not trying to hurt anybody. They just want to live a very decent, basic life, have food, and of course, I sent them to the Hour Center and places, but you know, the obvious places that they didn't know anything about. So, um, yeah, but thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, are there any? Um, I know Ellie Berto presented on the Home Study Program. We had Madeline's question um, around demographics. Diana, did you? Yeah, I actually had a, a question about the art, art um, center demographics and the, some of the figures. I have no idea if you can draw any conclusions from this, but I was looking at the data for 2020, the totals for rent were like 115,000. And then the totals for rent for the first quarter, slightly less if you're averaging it over four quarters, right? So can you extrapolate that the first quarter's better than the end of last year? I mean, maybe I'm just grasping at straws or being hopeful. Well, I, 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 I can speculate, I can't extrapolate. Um, so a couple of things, and I wanted to tell Madeline too, is, you know, as far as housing is concerned, there is so much resources. We, you know, uh, and, and the first resource is really the housing helpline. Um, and I know mm -hmm. I 
knows that well and, and she's part of the resources of, of the housing helpline. So Madeline, I can send you that if you don't have it. Please, uh, please do. I will. Uh, but That's that housing good. that housing helpline is really a huge help. Um, it, 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 is, it is the conduit for millions of federal dollars that are coming down the, the pipe. And there's a lot of state dollars as well. Like I said, Aviana is actually a one of the service parts of that because he provides the mediation for it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so on that side, I think the end of the, and that's the speculation that I would say, I, I think that part of it is, so what I, I, I talked about this before and, I, and I'll bring it up. Part of it is that what the R Center was seeing is when in the middle of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, they realized that so homesteady is really meant to help people stay housed and, and, and make sure it's a sustainable situation. And people were losing their jobs and there was no expectation of those jobs coming back in the near future. Wow. And in the midst of 2020, the R Center changed their the criteria basically saying you really have to demonstrate that that you um, that, that a participant is going to once again have some sort of gainful income coming in um, because what they were finding is they weren't really being able to help folks because they would run out of the money that Homesteady provided uh, because it's not a ton of money and so, you know, where in the past they might have, you know, been out of a job or in a medical situation where they had a, a month off that they couldn't, you know, and then home city would fill that gap. But it became very apparent that people weren't getting their jobs right away and people were going to be long term unemployed. And so there's other programs for that. And I think that's what you're seeing is that the R Center is assessing the situation and then saying, you know, home study may not be the best program for you. We have this other menu of options to provide support. So I think that's what's happening. So then maybe the, uh, sorry, Caitlin, if I can just follow up. Okay. So then maybe the opposite conclusion here is that because these funds were used for stable housing, that people are so unstable that they can't access these funds. So maybe things are actually worse rather than better. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, to to build on that, Elieberto, um I guess, I mean, I'm interested in knowing, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of other funding. Is the Our Center, um, they're administering some other funds for folks that are in more precarious situations. They haven't just sort of like upped the requirements for this one, but then turning right. folks away. Okay. Well, and, and the R Center is a family. So the R Center is part of the Family Resource Network. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a huge collaboration countywide. And so the R Center does have its own funding, but it also relies heavily on the Housing Helpline, which is run by uh, Boulder County Housing and Human Services. And, and they're really the, you know, for lack of a better word, they're the deep pockets right now. Um, they're the ones that receive millions of dollars for stable housing. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and, but, but the Air Center can tap into that, but people can tap into it directly by just calling that housing helpline. Got it. Okay, and that that's helpful and to see like that this home study program isn't really like, it's meeting a very, this is really designated for a very specific need that may have lessened during, because of the instability, like, instability. We, there may be some folks who need, obviously there are folks who need right. that, just like some short-term stabilization, but more folks are likely needing longer term stabilization and support. Right. Or, or much larger amounts. I've heard, I've heard tens of thousands. So anyway, I know other folks have their hands up. Okay. Uh, Deanna, did you have something else or no? Okay. Karen. Um. Yeah, so I think uh, listening to this, I think, Eliberto, one of the things that we probably also should put together is um, it, it is really an overview of, of all the 
basically all the, the federal dollars that have that are coming into Boulder County and are coming into Longmont um, that came in through um, the CARES Act, the money, because, uh, 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 you know, millions of dollars have come in for rental assistance, for utility assistance, um, and and um, and then we have the the next round, which is you know the um, the um, American Rescue Plan. The now we call the ARPA, uh, you know, funds. And so you know the city of Longmont um, is estimated to get fifteen million dollars. And then there's uh, you know a large chunk of money. Um, I think fifty million dollars is coming into um, to Boulder County. So so there there is. A, there are a lot of resources that are coming in to per, to help try to provide some some stabilization uh, to folks who have really um, lost so much during the the pandemic. And so, I think it would be super helpful if we try to put that information together, just for the the sake of the conversation we just had earlier about having seen some some context about what's you know what's. Um, you know, what's happening. So I think that would be worthwhile too. Do you know, um, so Ellie Berto, you mentioned the housing helpline to, to Madeline um, for some of those other funding um, pieces that are coming in, Karen. Um, could we also get um, information about how, fo- like different ways folks can access that? Or does the city have sort of a f- anything, like a short thing that we could share? Because I'm just thinking, um, I see a lot of folks in, you know, Facebook groups and like in our church community that may need support and would love to know, like, you know, with that context of the money of like, okay, I know Longmont's getting money. I know it's there. I just don't know where to go. And so what are some of the places um, in addition? I mean, we know the hour center, we know some of these agencies, but are there other places folks should be looking or checking, um, you know, within the community? I don't know if the city has, I think, you know, the city sharing what, you know, we've gotten in terms of funds and then also how folks can get help, um, you know, sort of marketing it in a way. Um, Cause I think Madeline's experience where people don't know that information, right. like even folks who are connected are like, well, I know there's funding there and I know you can get some of it through the hour center and you can call this helpline, but then there's a feeling of like, okay, but where out, like, should I be checking other places? Am I going to miss out on something? It, you know, if, if I'm not, if I don't qualify for that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think I'll just um, speak to that. If that's okay. Karen um, is that, that is, that is really a key issue. So we're trying to, to figure out how, how to make that, how to make that easily, more easily um, understood and and where you go. So kind of that housing helpline has really been our um, kind of our our go-to source. Um, And because they've hired some additional staff, they also can, you know, help to direct where other, um, where families could go for other assistance if it's not, you know, if it's not or if it's beyond or in addition to housing, um, housing assistance. So, so, so we are we are absolutely trying to to work on that. Um, so to 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 really yeah. try to make it easier, and it is not easy. So, uh, but we we are we are, are doing our, our best around. And I know there are so many. I mean, we've talked about We're kind of started really- with that housing helpline, but there is a funders collaborative that meets the, okay. you know a couple of times a, a week. So we are trying to figure out how to make it easier for for folks to access the resources that they need. Great. Um, Karen Phillips. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, if somebody called the city of Longmont and said they needed, would they be able to direct them somewhere with some help? Depends on who they called at the city of Longmont. I mean, like the main number. The, you know, if they call the main number, you, you know, prob- probably not. I mean, so, I mean, I think that is, so what we hope is that they would send them our way, you know, they would send them to community services. So they would either, if it was, if it's um, housing and human services, it's usually Karen, Eliberto, um, community neighborhood resources. But, but, but that really is the the challenge. So there isn't like a point person, right? Uh, f- for all of your needs in this whole arena, here's where you go in the city of Lamont to get every piece of information that you need. 
um, we're we're trying to figure out how to do that. Yeah. But if it's they eventually, of- I think if no one else, if they don't know where else to go and they call in terms of the city, it usually comes to community services. Well, that's good. Yeah. So they, there's a direction. So. <laughs> yeah. Good. Great. Thank you all. Um, are there any, is there any other feedback? Oh, go ahead, Karen. I just had one, one comment to say, um, last night I attended the Longmont, uh, Longmont area Dems and they were talking, we had a great discussion about the police and funding and all that kind of thing. And they were talking about starting this, uh, citizen advisory board. And it, it occurred to me that I thought that's kind of what we are. And, you know, they were talking about, you know, well, we need to start this thing and talk about homelessness and find housing. And it's just like, you know, my mind was like, well, now these people need to be told that, you know, you're welcome to come to this meeting every month. And I mean, it's already there, but nobody knows about it. So I don't know if someone could go to their next meeting and say, you know, instead of starting a, a, a citizen advisory board you already have one you know the, the, i mean i thought that's kind of what we do or are supposed to do and people would participate by joining these meetings but we never have anybody joining a meeting so i don't know i just I, it just struck me funny that they would talk about well you know if we we need to address some of these issues with the police and we've already kind of done that and i just was like well you know you could participate in our group you know but anyway Councilwoman Christensen. Karen, I think you're exactly right. I, uh, you know, every day we get emails that have uh, 50 groups that all do the same thing. And um, I hear groups say, we should stay up, have a police oversight committee. We have a police oversight committee. We, you know, but they don't know about it. And uh, this is a problem. We have so much information and yet, it is hard to sort through the information to see what's relevant. And I think this is kind of a, a problem of our times. But anyway, I, I thank you for bringing that up because I, it's frustrating to me too. People say, well, nobody's doing anything about this, but they are actually, it's just, you don't know about it. Sure. Yeah. I, I feel like we're a citizen advisory board, kind of. I mean, don't you think that's what we are doing? I think that's the goal here is to have community members uh, providing well, that advisory. Maybe I could mention it. I mean, there was 36 people that attended that meeting. And just to say, you know, instead of starting an advisory board, there's already one existing and the meeting is the second Thursday of the month and any, anybody's welcome to comment or participate. So that was kind of part of what we talked about doing in terms of making it known and, and making it ourselves known within the community that we're here and you know I'm there are people that know me within <clears throat> within my circle excuse me and yeah that was kind of <clears throat> excuse me why we uh, said we were going to do more <clears throat> marketing about us who we are and what we do. So I uh, I think that can do nothing. Yeah, I think I think we're on the right track. We just gotta see it through. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. but yeah, we were on the right track. And uh, yeah, we just gotta finish it. That's all. Okay. <laughs> That's I agree. I couldn't yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree with you more. All right. Um, is there any other business that we need to cover? Ellie Berto, yes. So Karen and I talked, and, and Caitlin, you've seen this, and um, uh, and so has Brian. But I, I wanted to just let the board know that you know after our last conversation around, um, you know, the human services funding matrix, uh, I, we have continued work, and I, and I wanted to show something to the board tonight. It's very draft, which is why I didn't send it out. Um, in fact, I just created it last week after you know after looking more deeply at what what Brian had created. But I, it I in my mind it, it does it may help provide a visual and um, 
about our our funding matrix and how we we look at our goals, our outcomes, and our activities. And I just wanted to share that with the board, if if, if you would be okay with that, Galen. I think that's fine. Okay, and we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it because it's, it's draft, but I wanted the board to see it and, and just to be aware that we are we are continuing to work on that. So I'm gonna share, I'm gonna find it, and then I'm gonna share and Ellie my- Ellie Berto, just to just add clarity too, um, at our last meeting, um, we talked about um, looking at the matrix, but also um, simplifying how we're evaluating agencies when we get to the funding round, because um, we, I think there was, we had quite a bit of discussion about how we were getting really, really specific and trying to measure things. But in, in the end, um, a lot of the information was maybe not necessarily helping us make better decisions, um, that we want something that does help us be more objective, but we don't necessarily want something so complex um, under the idea that we're somehow gonna get it perfect. Um, complexity does not equal better necessarily. And so we wanted to, to um, step back and think about how could we simplify this and really help folks understand the connection between the city's goals and what the agencies are doing and asking money for um, rather than trying to get into as, you know, and, and what, what the city's goals are, but also what the human needs assessment shows us um, being able to pull both of those things together with the agencies recognizing like these agencies, some of them are really small. Some of them don't have grant writers like the city has that sort of thing. And so um, being able to have a better way of um, thinking about it that everyone can wrap their heads around. Right. So hopefully this is helpful to you all. Um, I'm gonna share, uh, again, we don't have to spend tons of time on it but I wanted to, to just show you what I've been working on and, and we'll continue to try and and, and refine and, and get be, be more useful. So what you're seeing here, and I know it's small, I can zoom in. So if, if we, the way that when Brian did his great work on the larger spreadsheet, he basically break, broke it down into three tiers and this reflects that. The first tier, when we think about funding or importance of funding is really, is the application, does it fit under our safety net pillars, right? So, self, so for example, this is self-sufficiency and resiliency. Uh, that's tier one, they have to be, they have to meet tier one. If they don't meet tier one, then they're not to be considered. Tier two, are, are what are our what did the what did the human service needs assessment say and what we what has the board considered in the past as our program outcomes and Brian did a really great job most of this is is from Brian's work to take everything that we had in the human needs assessment and really turn it into outcome language not just philosophicals there's something else that we talked about as we talked about last time you know the human needs assessment was a little broader and so we brought this down to much more here are the program outcomes of increased earnings employment or eligible benefits uh or to support ability to secure steady employment increase ability to earn the wage so those are outcomes um and so you know these are some of the outcomes that we talked about some of them are pretty simple the the, the human service system talked about the digital the digital divide and bridging that then there is tier three, and this also came from the human needs assessment is what activities does the program need to be doing that we wanna fund, right? Um, and we can talk about, you know, are there activities not that we didn't capture? We could, we could send out the human service needs assessment again, you know, but here are just some examples of activities that were, so to reach these outcomes, we wanna provide financial literacy or we wanna provide English language acquisition. Uh, to provide the increased lift to, it really came, one of the activities was people need reliable transportation, for, in other words, for, for them to stay uh, living independently. Um, they need, and this goes back to the, to that no wrong door. The activity to that is provide information about available resources and reduce difficulties in finding and navigation navigating the human services system. So 
really an agency can apply for if that's the program they're doing. So for example, I'm going to say CPWD uh, does this, right? Because one, a big part of their activity is their information and referral process. Um, so in other words, they help people navigate the system and they track it. Um, and then there, there was another one about transportation, but it was in particular to car repair, right? And so we may decide that that activity is not something the city wants to fund, uh, but I, I, I put it in there um, for uh, just as an example. Um, and then on the bridging, bridging the digital divide, the activities are provide access to broadband internet or internet capable devices, increase digital literacy, or increase access to device charging outlets. Again, not necessarily these are the activities that we want to fund, but this was in the human service needs assessment. And I think this helps us see it in a different way. I'm not going to go through, I did all six of them and I can send it to the board, uh, but I just wanted to share tonight some of the work that I've done on trying to simplify, uh, and, but at the same time, ensure that we are still you know, uh, for keeping fidelity to the human services needs assessment. I think this is really helpful, Eliberto, and I like the, um, you, you, you phrased it as like tier one, tier two, tier three, um, but I, the hierarchy of it, of like, you really need to fit into tier one, into like the tier one before we even look at tier two, and then before we look at tier three, because we want to make sure your outcomes are the outcomes, you know, if your outcomes aren't there, the activities you do are almost certainly not going to be there, but also, um, if somehow those activities are what we say, but they're not reaching the overall outcomes we want, me, you know, then maybe it's not it's not what we want to fund. Um, so I really like this and um, as a as a mechanism for thinking about it um, and using this as to think about how we do the scoring. Um, so I appreciate you and Brian trying to give us another way of like wrapping our heads around how <laughs> these pieces fit together. So, uh, Diana. Yeah, I raised my hand as soon as Eliberto finished to basically say what you said much more eloquently than I would have said. So um, yes, just that I thought that was a really helpful way of looking at it. And I um, appreciate the reframing of that. Well, I think it's really helpful. Same here, same here. Kim Kimberly and then Karen Thank Phillips. Thank you for putting in a format that's so much easier to understand, especially as a new advisory board member. I would love to see something, and again, I. I don't know the details of the rating system, but I would love to see something referencing um, health of children and youth. Um, and I don't know how specific it needs to be. I just feel like that's something that's um, important to address. And maybe it's already captured under the human services access piece that I saw is written in that far right column. Um, so I just have to do my part to <laughs> promote child and, and youth health because I, I think that's so important to our community and, and deserves a special note. Yeah. Um, just to add, uh, so I think Eliberto, you showed one, the first slide, which is just one of the six pillars that we do. Um, I think the first one was self-sufficiency and resilience. One of the high level pillars we have is actually health and well-being. Um, and so um, when Eliberto sends it out, I think it'd be good to look at that because I think it looks like we pulled that primarily from the human service needs assessment and we may want to expand on what some of the outcomes are or some of the activities are um, that we know will help meet those. So um, thank you for that advocacy. You can really, uh, as, as a new member, it's hard to like wrap your head around the fact that there's like six of these and all these, some activities fit into both. Um, so I think Eliberto getting that sent out so folks can see all of them will be really helpful. So uh, Karen Phillips. I just wanted to say, I really appreciate the simplicity of it. It makes it very easy to understand and simpler the better as far as I see it. So thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, I'm even imagining like our um, criteria, like when, or when we're filling out the ratings of this is really being like, does it meet this first, which does it meet the pillar that they say it does? Do we think it does? And then like, if so, then add, like, does it meet th these outcomes? How well does it meet these outcomes? And then the activities to really get a sense of that. Um, because I'm like, that's a lot easier than some of the, um, it's a lot easier to s map it into this than some of the ways I think I was trying to map it last year. Um, 
being able to map it to these sorts of things would be really helpful to say like, okay, this one does increase access to dental care, but maybe it's only like a six out of 10 on the scale. I don't know how we want to do this, but there's some different ways we could think about using this for scoring to help us score how well agencies seem to be meeting our objectives. Um, other feedback or questions for Eliberto on this? Um, okay, I think folks would really love to see, oh, uh, Brian? Uh, just Eliberto, thank you for all your work that you did on that because I think it's it's really helpful. Yes. Um, okay, uh, yes, Karen Roney. So just, um, whoops. So to build on Madeline's uh, reminder about marketing ourselves, um, I don't think that, it, maybe I have, or maybe you sent them to El Alberto, but I think those bios that we sent out in the last packet, I don't, I don't know if anyone has completed theirs. So, so we're gonna send them out again and uh, and we'll we'll provide um, we'll provide some additional instruction or required you know when to send those back to us. So um, so anyhow, so I'm just building on Madeline's reminder that uh, we 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 need we need those bios. So we will we will send that out again. Thanks, Karen. And I'm going to put a reminder on my own calendar to do it, but um, I'm also going to add another reminder to um, ask Karen who's done it. And then I'll, I'll um, you know, I'll give you a call. Um, I might bring by like some cookies or something if you get it done by a certain <laughs> time. I'm not above like a little bit of um, non-valuable bribery. Um, <laughs> there, I'm not actually like giving you something of huge value or actually bribing you. I'm just yeah. offering an incentive to get it done. People are super busy. So, you know, and, and yeah. so we, we, uh, we, we will, um, we will send it out again as, as, as a reminder for, for, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I, yeah. I understand that. And good food is my love language, which is why I offer to bribe people with food. Um, <laughs> Is there any other business? Okay. Um, in that case, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Okay. Diana moves and Madeline, I'm going to assume that that's a second. Yeah, absolutely. And you're adjourned. See you all in about a month. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>